Hi, y'all. I'll be responding to another gun control video. I was sent a link to a video by a guy named uh, Autopsy87, or 67, I don't have my glasses on, one or the other, titled American Gun Culture. This is going to be a very polite video. The guy seems like he's trying, so I'm going to give him the extension of a bit of good faith here. So, um, take it away, sir. Look, a serious conversation needs to happen on the subject of guns in America. I've been on both sides and all points in between in the past on this issue, and maybe... If someone can make some goddamn sense to me, I'll adjust my current perspective. But as it stands right now, I am fucking done. The arguments that I keep hearing in favor of our current gun system do little more than nauseate me. I have this conversation damn near daily with family members. And remember, I was born and raised here in Texas. And I come from a family of hunters who own multiple fucking guns. And they're all responsible law-abiding members of society. Here is the gist of my position. Guns are indeed a tool, and a tool in the right hands can be used for positive means. Now, let's consider the purpose of this particular tool. The sole reason for this tool's existence... This is one of the difficulties in having a conversation with uh, people who are in favor of gun control or who want to have a serious conversation. You make a categorical claim that's just false, and that puts people like me on my guard, because right out of the gate, you're already slipping in something that's just not true. The, uh, the gun enthusiast or the gun rights advocate or whatever the hell you want to call people who uh, want to keep their guns is a big tent. You have a lot of people in it. Some of them are hunters. Some of them aren't. Some people are interested in def uh, you know, defense of their home against burglars. Some of them aren't. Uh, you get combinations of these things, and then you have another class of, of gun enthusiasts who are sportsmen or sportswomen. Their interest is in the mastery of self and the mastery of a tool in being able to outcompete the, their fellows on a field. It's just not true that the sole purpose for uh, firearms is killing or maiming, uh, in general or in particular, killing and maiming other people. Just not true. And this doesn't uh, say anything whatever about the fact that uh, you have many instances where uh, violence is thwarted, it is stopped uh, ab initio because of the presentation of deadly force and the fact that one party or the other apprehends the nature of the weapon and appreciates that their circumstances are such that they should immediately desist in their bad conduct. This is very uh, handy in law enforcement. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we in law enforcement, I'm not in it now, but I used to be, uh, we pull our guns more frequently than we actually maim or kill anybody with them. So it's just not true that the sole purpose is killing and maiming. There are other ancillary purposes, some of them are corollary purposes, and some of them are tangential. So it just gets really annoying, and it's hard to extend any notion of, of good faith on uh, to, to believe that about your interlocutor. Uh, when you say things that are just not true. Is to kill and or maim. It was created for such, it is marketed as such, and society uses it as such. That's true, um, that it is marketed as that, but it's also true that it's marketed for other things. I refer you to the sportsmen, people who don't go out and hunt. Uh, you know, people who go to, like, the Olympics or whatever. These are legitimate uses of firearms. They are real uses of firearms, and they are a real market that is catered to. Stop denying the existence of these people. It gets really annoying. The choice is up to the individual in control of the tool. Yes. We can agree on that. Sure. But what better fucking reason could there be for society to want to limit access to such a tool? All right. You want, uh, you want the tool to only ever be in good hands. I agree. I want uh, zero evil people to have any guns or any bullets. And I want every good person who wants to have a firearm to have his firearm or her firearm uh, for you know, whatever it is they need or want it for. That's their business, not mine. The difficulty is that you can't have a universe where you're able to do that. And I, I know you understand this. I've listened to better than half of your video, so I know you appreciate this fact. Uh, it, it's just not feasible to be able to screen that well, no matter what you do. So the only conclusion, or the end state of the conclusions of uh, ever-encroaching uh, gun control rules, is that eventually, 
to try to mitigate the number of bad hands they get into, you wind up saying, well, no good people can be trusted with it because one of the uh, one of the down the road effects of that is that it, it it'll one of those guns is going to wind up in the wrong person's hands, and that's why you get people like me who say to you, no, we have a hundred years of gun control laws, and at zero point in time, zero periods in the United States history has it ever been true that a single proposed gun control law has produced the effects that the gun control advocates claim their laws will do, all of which are marketed as sensible laws, all of which are marketed as reasonable laws. That's what they're argued for, that's what they're agitated for, that's the debate, and finally the people on my side say, you know what, we can deal with a little bit of inconvenience here. We can deal with a little bit of inconvenience here. We can deal with it there, we can deal with it there, and after a hundred years of this, we're now many thousands of laws into this process of, um, no, we promise this time uh, it will really produce the effect that we claimed it would have produced all the other times and it didn't. This time's different, we promise. And what you're seeing now is just about the natural limit to what uh, gun, you know, gun owners, gun rights activists like myself are willing to tolerate before you start getting a real hard pushback and just, you know, really you're at the point of where we're sticking our fingers in our ears and going, la la la, I can't hear you. It's been a century. Every time you've said this, every time people on your side have said this, you've been wrong, you've been dead wrong, it has never worked. Your next law is going to be just like all the ones that came before it. And eventually, if you play this out, if you play out the end game, it's going to wind up with no firearms in no good people's hands, or almost no firearms in almost no good people's hands. And uh, so you're just reaching the natural limit of this back and forth that's been going on for a century. And the counter arguments I'm hearing are overwhelmingly dense. Number one, more people die from car accidents than gun accidents. Uh, that is an a fortiori argument. It is a particular case of a more general argument, which is that more people are killed by cars than are killed by firearms. Full stop. So you take up all, you count all the firearm deaths. Suicide, homicide, accidental, other. You count up that pile of corpses, and then you set next to it the pile of corpses that are piled up from uh, car crash, just car accidents. This isn't people who use uh, their weapons, uh, their vehicles as weapons and to intentionally commit a murder, which does happen. Put those off to the side. Just motor vehicle accidents. Accidents. The pile of corpses you have from just car crashes, the accidental ones, the unintended ones, is larger than all of the gun deaths from all sources, whatever, good intent, bad intent, or accidental. So it's not simply that more people are killed in car accidents than are killed in gun accidents. It's that cars, something that people will readily concede is not designed to be a weapon. It's not the thing you naturally think of when, God, I'm going to kill somebody, you know, where's my Buick? That, that isn't the thought process that goes through too many people's heads, though it does go through some. Uh, nevertheless, its collateral effect, just its in, one of the incidentals of having it, is a stack of corpses larger than what you're getting from the thing that you're claiming is used solely for killing and maiming. So the, that uh, raises the question. If this thing, these cars, can just as a casual side effect, gen, you know, year after year after year, generate piles of corpses larger, then this thing that you're claiming has only one purpose, killing and maiming, then perhaps um, the, these cars are just way too deadly because their, act, their incidental effect outweighs all of the bad effects of guns to include all the intentionally bad acts. Anyway, so it, it, because it's true that car deaths exceed all gun deaths, it is a fortiori true that car deaths, the accidental ones, exceed gun accidents. And by the way, uh, well, you'll talk about it in a second. I'll wait till you do that. We understand that allowing private citizens to drive cars can be very dangerous. So we train and grant licenses to people to drive. We d you grant a license to a person when they're asking your permission to do a thing, when they're asking to make use of a privilege, something to which they have no legal claim of right. Firearms are in a different category. Uh, there are, I've mentioned this in other videos, but the reason that the things that are mentioned in the Bill of Rights are there isn't necessarily because they're the most important rights that, that exist. I mean, there's no constitutional right written any, anywhere in there to breathe, uh, to eat, and yet those are quite fundamental. You can't survive long without doing both of those two things, and nowhere in there does it mention you have a right to food or a right to be fed if you're in prison or anything like that. And 
And the reason that the things that are in the Bill of Rights are in the Bill of Rights is because those are what tyrants go after. When you want to oppress people, it's helpful if they can't print things that call out your bullshit when you're trying to gain power. So you want to make a law that prohibits a heretical speech. You want to have a law that prohibits bad thinking. You want to have a law that prevents people from persuading other people to agree with them and not you, the tyrant. That's the First Amendment. You want to control their religious lives. This is just a particular case of controlling thought. You definitely want to make sure they don't have the capacity in any meaningful way to even be inconvenient to you. So you don't want all the wrong kind of people having guns. And in this case, all the wrong kind of people means people who don't agree with the, uh, the despot's view of the world, whatever it happens to be. Um, it could be any old goofy thing. Uh, you, you don't have a right to your own property to keep you know, the government troops out of it, quartering them there just all willy nilly. I mean, the Third Amendment. You wouldn't think about that today, but these are the types of things that tyrants think about. It's much easier to control a civilian population if you can just have your armed troops live among them. The Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, the notion of due process. It's much easier if you can have a Soviet-style show trial uh, where the person is conscripted into being an instrument of their own demise. They have to actively participate in proving why they should be put to death. That's very handy if you're Stalin. Quite useful, I can, I can assure you. Um, so that's why the Bill of Rights is there. It isn't because these are the most important fundamental liberties that could possibly exist. It's because these are historically the things that tyrants want to control. And when you start letting them control them a little bit, a little bit over time adds up to a lot. Go back to what I was saying earlier. We're now a century along in this enterprise of uh, more and more and more laws on guns, on gun control. And, you know, each time, it's, it's, it's a small step. Each step is, is a little bit. But after a century of a whole bunch of little steps, you now have a large step. And you've got thousands upon thousands of laws on this that have been slowly added over better more than a century, pretty much with people having some quibbles here, having some quibbles there, but saying, you know, it's just a little bit, we can get along with it. Well, one of the... The gun control laws never produce the effects they're claimed to affect. They're claimed that they will produce, as I mentioned. But people also grow up with a certain level of access to their rights. And they just, they just get used to that. And so then it's very easy to then propose something new because to them, they don't remember what it was like when they had more freedoms. You know, it, it's like uh, the elephants in, in the circus. They're, they really can break that small string that holds them, but that's not what they've been trained on. They've been trained on a much larger chain. And so psychologically, there's, they think that the thing is capable of doing what it is, what, what it can't do. They, they believe something that's not true. They're accustomed to a state of affairs that simply isn't the way that uh, it, it uh, well, in the case of the chain and the rope, it's simply not the way it really is in reality and the corollary here in, in society is you grow up with a certain level of freedom that you think is just the way it's supposed to be. And all of these little steps, anybody who's taken calculus, or uh, even introduction to calculus, will understand the nature of limits, that if you have uh, an infinite number of infinitely thin strips, over time, if you get you know a lot of those, it adds up to a lot of area that's been covered. And that's what you're looking at now. For example, listen to the language that comes out of the gun control side of the argument. They'll say, gun rights advocates, people like me, the NRA, I'm not a member of it, the NRA says a lot of stupid shit, wouldn't be a member of it if they paid me. But anyway, you'll say things like, they oppose reasonable gun laws. Bullshit. Most people on my side of the argument aren't arguing to repeal any of the, the thousands of laws that we have. You, know, you get some people want to repeal this one or that one, but in the main, we can get by with what we've got at the moment. But because this is your baseline, in the same way that the chain is the baseline in the mind of the elephant and then the little string holds them, when you start talking about gun control laws, you have forgotten about the thousands of interior ones and you just you start talking as though it's a fresh slate, nothing exists, and all you want to do is propose the first law and it's completely unreasonable to agree that we take one single step in the way of gun control. Whereas I'm going to, in every instance, recall to your attention, there are thousands of laws that have developed over more than a century. We're not talking about one gun control law. We're talking about one more gun control law on the back of thousands of previous gun control laws. This is uh, just the sloppy language that betrays the lack of thought 
that emanates from the gun control side. Part of it's rhetorical device on some people's part. They're, they're intentionally deceptive. And part of it is just not having thought through the issues, which I think is true of a lot of people who are in favor of gun control. Don't declare it a goddamn birthright. We test a driver's ability to function before giving them legal... As I mentioned before I pause this, distinction between a right and a privilege. You go get a license when you're begging for permission. With a right, you shouldn't have to do that. And if you think that there's, a, there's not a distinction, then uh, you should not have any problem whatever if I proposed that black people should have to prove that they can read before they can vote that black people should have to get a license before they can vote. That black people, no one, no one's going to, well, I can't say no one, most people are not going to accept that because you immediately spot what is wrong with saying why should they have to go prove something other than some, you know, the most basic kind of thing like they're a citizen or some shit in order to exercise their rights. You, you, you can only go so far and then beyond that you need to go to Article 5. Anything beyond that is just beyond the pale. No one would accept a century and more of ever restrictive voting laws generally, or for blacks in particular, or any other group in particular. Because you immediately see that there is a distinction between the right and uh, a privilege. Now, before people say they're different, they're different in, in one respect. I mean, the, the object that is the subject of the, of, the, of the legislation is different, but the effects, it, you, um, who's going to gain say that bad voting doesn't produce calamities. I mean, if you think that that's not true, that bad voting causes all kinds of mayhem, I'm pretty sure there are a couple hundred thousand people in Iraq who would still be alive today if George Bush had not been elected. Voting has consequences, too. The distinction that seems to come up is that happens far away. We don't care so much about that. But there's booming happening, in our, happening here in our country, and that's, that seems to be more important because it's closer. And another uh, thing that's built up in the car deaths versus gun deaths um, thing is that it's not the mountain of corpses people are worried about. It's the loud noise that precedes them that, that really bothers people. It isn't the, if you think that, uh, that it's the mountain of corpses that really matters and not how they got there, you're fully, you've deluded yourself. There are almost a half a million people in the United States who are killed every year because of medical care. This isn't cases where the doctors go off the reservation and fuck things up. This is just a consequence of having modern medicine. Because there's a lot of bullshit in medicine and it leads more than 400,000 people to their deaths every year. No one bats an eyelash. It's the third leading cause of death in the United States. Um, not losing any sleep over that. It's not, you can get a mountain of corpses if you want them so long as you, you play your arguments just right. Access to public roads. Granted, we could do a much better job of this, but unlike with firearms... To, get, to give you another idea, I'll do this in a separate video. At least an effort has been made. Number two, people can be killed with bats, clubs, and knives just as easily. It's very true that people can be killed with many different inanimate objects. But again, we should consider the purpose and use of these objects by society. Also take into consideration that a single individual cannot near as easily rack up the same body count with a knife that he or she can with a gun. It, it's, it's true. It takes a little bit more effort. When this seems to me that the objection that underlies this is that uh, modern murderers, they just don't really have to work for it like they have to, used to do in the good old days or in the bad old days. And, and we really want a better class of murderers. We want to make sure they're really dedicated. I, I, I know that's not what you're arguing, but that's what always pops into my head when I hear this. Look, look at Australia. You're going to mention uh, these other countries later. Australia, you know, got all of its... There's a gnat in the house or something. Fruit fly. Uh, Australia got all of its um, gun laws that it wanted, and their mass murderers just changed tools. Uh, you know, on average, not any greater or lesser death toll than, you know, is wrought with firearms. What they do now is they use the very high-tech uh, equipment of a chain and a little bit of uh, petroleum products and a match. So, you know, they went from shooting people to burning them to death en masse. Oh, and by the way, you'll talk about this later. One man cannot hold an entire room of adults hostage and pick them off one after another as easily with a knife or a bat as they can with a firearm. Yeah, and they can't do either easily if you walk into a room where everyone in that room is in fact armed. It, uh, this plays out in police departments throughout the United States every year. Some, some guy uh, will walk in there and want to shoot up 
a whole bunch of cops. The death toll in those mass shooting attempts, those mass murder attempts, is actually fairly predictable, and it's approximately one per gunman. And the reason for that is quite simple. When you walk into a room where everyone else is armed, your lifespan, your life expectancy, is measured in seconds, not in minutes, not in half an hour, not in hours, like it is in some of these school shootings. You know, you look at the, the Columbine shooting, and, and the police will show up and say, and they'll take all the credit for the lives they saved. Uh, you watch, um, what, uh, there's a good documentary on it, I'll see if I can find it and put a link to it below. The parents at the end of it made a very uh, salient point. The cops didn't save a fucking person in that building. Those children saved their own lives, not the cops. The cops did what cops ordinarily do. You cordon off the area, control the mayhem, and you let it play out until, you know, some hours later when the SWAT team is finished looking at things and they're ready to move in, by which time these things have generally played out. Not always, but generally. That's the law enforcement strategy. Cordon it off, control the death toll, don't jeopardize your officers. Some agencies are moving away from that, thankfully. Uh, but it has been standard practice for years. Cordon it off, stand there, and let the people inside be slaughtered as slow or as fast as the person inside wants to do, this, to do the slaughtering. This should go without saying. This should be common sense. Knives also serve other uses than killing and or maiming, and the same can be said with bats and clubs. And firearms. Number three, criminals don't obey laws, and they won't obey gun laws. This is basically the banning guns just takes them away from the good people argument. There's a reason we don't see nearly the same amount of gun violence in countries where guns have been banned. The fact is that... Uh, well, there are reasons for that. Um, there are reasons that you don't see the same murder rate. You see mo lower murder rates in those countries. The reason the latter fact I mentioned is true is because it was also true before they had the gun bans. Back when the United States had fairly lax gun laws in relation to these other countries, they then also had lower murder rates, lower homicide rates, lower gun homicide rates. You know, um, one of the ones here is Australia that people really like to talk about. Um, I get this thrown in my face all the time, so the Australia objection, and they'll say, oh, well, you know, the homicide rates in Australia are wonderful now. You go back and look in the early 90s, 91, 92, 93, the homicide rate in Australia, I'll put a link to it below, these are official statistics by the government of Australia, the homicide rate in Australia, 91, 90, 92, 90, you know, that area, 1.9. What's the murder rate in Australia today? It is exactly the same. It is exactly the same. It's 1.9. These are 2013 statistics. The 2014 aren't released yet, and obviously the 2015 aren't released yet. Uh, and I will note that the 2013 statistics, that's a four-year low, which is to say that back before they had uh, this gun ban, uh, they had lower crime rates than they had at some periods of time after the gun ban. And indeed, uh, from the 90s on, the, the murder rate has been much higher than it was you know, between, say, 1920 and 1975, where they had extremely lax gun laws. And this isn't just in bodies counted. This is in a uh, proportion of the population. Now, there are things that could explain uh, that. For example, from the 1920s to the 1970s, they might not have had good record keeping, so it could have been much higher. There's just no way to demonstrate it because the records weren't kept. That, was, that, that could be true. Also, between the 1920s and the 1970s, the, generally in the older times, not the later ones, uh, it was not um, a perfectly great place to live with respect to your government. There were massacres carried out by the government against the citizens of Australia. We'll return to that kind of point a little bit later. So, you mentioned gun murders. Yes, they, they managed to get some gun murders down, or gun homicides down. They've done nothing for the homicide rate. Nothing at all. They've done a lot of work, uh, written a lot of laws, putting a lot of people in jail, I'm sure, scared a lot of citizens, had their forced confiscation, which they called a buyback. Good piece of marketing there. There's no such thing as a government buyback of a firearm. The government can't buy back that which it did not previously own. Uh, great piece of PR there, I have to say. So good job, propaganda. But in any event, it has done fuck all for their murder rate. Congratulations. Lots of effort. Same outcomes. Now, all you can be guaranteed is that when people are being uh, murdered in Australia, it's slower than it used to be. So apparently it's preferable if people are slowly hacked to death than if they are shot to death. It's preferable if they're burned to death than if they are shot to death. It is preferable if they are stomped to death, beaten to death, than if they are shot to death. So, good work, Australia.
easy access to a legal gun market means easier access to an illegal gun market. Basically, it's easier to get an illegal firearm in America than England because America's legal market has loose regulation and easy access. Also, there is some very warped logic around the idea that we shouldn't make a law because a criminal is not going to follow it. By that rationale... That isn't the argument. The argument is, if you make a law, only the law-abiding citizens are going to follow it. Now, I thought in the beginning we had mentioned that we want to keep... Well, I had mentioned, and I was taking your argument to be something along the lines of similar. You want the, to keep all the guns out of the bad hands and not uh, dispossess the innocent law-abiding people of their firearms. However, whenever you make a law, you can only be guaranteed to affect the people who will obey it. That is to say, you will only effectively disarm those people who are more interested in obeying the law than they are in insisting upon their liberties. While you don't do that to the criminals, they are by definition not particularly interested in following the law. Now, of course, there's going to be some bleed over there. Every time you write a law, you magically create new criminals. Um, so that, that's the argument. We shouldn't have laws prohibiting murder and rape because criminal. Okay, we all want uh, anybody who engages in certain conduct to be prosecuted, no matter what. Murder, rape, arson, those kinds of the Milman say type laws. Uh, but I thought we had distinguished between good hands and bad hands earlier. And here you have a division. You have good people and bad people. We want the bad people to go away to the extent possible while not fucking with the good people to the extent possible. The argument that uh, if, you're, if you're not in favor of laws that are only guaranteed to fuck with the good people, uh, that might maybe or maybe not fuck with the bad people, then we shouldn't have any laws at all, is just a misconstruing of what the argument uh, is claiming to argue for. Those obviously aren't following them. Number four, gun control won't stop people from killing one another. And it's true. People throughout history, long before guns were invented, have been killing each other for insane reasons with all sorts of objects. And even if the technology to create guns was erased from our collective knowledge as a species, people would still find ways to kill one another. But again, my entire point is the ease and effectiveness guns provide someone with ill intent. Here he's showing a video of a, a store where a person is being slowly murdered with a gun. A person is shot, scurrying around on the floor, bleeding all over the place to really gen up some emotion, to really, really drive it home. Um, what he won't show, because it's difficult to get video of this, is like what happens in Australia when they want to go into a public place and uh, slaughter people with things not that aren't firearms. For example, the arson example I mentioned earlier. Very easy to do. You lock the door, well, you throw in the accelerant, uh, and, and the fire, you start the fire, and then you lock the door, and you walk away. And the people in there just die. It's very difficult to get video of that because the cameras melt. Um, now, I've been told that there are reasons that we don't burn people at the stake, but we did have firing squads. There are reasons that we don't have butchering squads, but we have had firing squads. There are reasons that we put people to death by electrocution, but not by beating them to death as a method of execution. And it's because uh, there are certain ways of killing people that are gratuitously uh, torturous. Burning them at the stake, uh, beating them slowly to death, slowly stabbing them to death, that don't really uh, happen when, you're, when you want to be an efficient killer. This is why I mentioned earlier, apparently, it would be better if you're going to be murdered, which everyone concedes is going, you know, some people are just going to be murdered in the future. The only thing to be arbitrated is how. Apparently, um, it, it's much better if you die slowly and, and in as much pain as is possible. Uh, that is a good price to be paid in order to make sure that uh, certain kinds of people, law-abiding you know, law folks, will be dispossessed of their firearms in a way that they aren't right now. And that's the trade-off that you're being asked to imagine. Because the murders are going to happen, all that you can do is something that deals with how they're going to happen. And all these other things that are inefficient uh, means that they are more painful. This is a more torturous way for murderers to commit their murders than just putting a bullet through someone's head. Uh, so there are trade-offs 
on either side of the equation. Unlike the gun control fetishists, I don't play up the positive and ignore the negative aspects of my side. Uh, that's what you're getting here. Guns are efficient. Yes, that they're efficient also means that they're less painful, so people die quicker deaths. And I do want to point out, in any murder, it's a forced choice. fact is that the moment someone has a gun, they instantly become lethal. That's true. That applies if you're a five foot two woman of, a, of 85 pounds who is confronting an intruder in your home who's six foot three and 285 pounds, you're just as able to kill him as he's able to kill you with the same tool. It is precisely that fact that makes it exactly useful as a tool. But as you mentioned in the beginning, uh, you can do some good with tools in good hands, and you can do some evil with that same tool in the bad hands. Even a small child with a pistol poses an immediate life-threatening situation in a way that no other object causes. These are some of the more serious arguments, of course, because I'm not getting into the wingnut arguments about how Hitler took the guns before imposing tyranny and shit. That's true, though. Well, against the wrong kind of people. People in the Nazi party got to keep theirs. I have no ambition of changing the minds of teabaggers who think their pathetic little militia bands are even going to slow the government down, let alone take it over. Uh, I've done videos on this before, but I'll lay my understanding of military tactics against yours any day. You do not have an appreciation of reality. Uh, maybe there are some people who go around and say this, but the argument generally is not that my guns are the only thing. It isn't. There are multiple things, of which our firearms are but one. Multiple checks, multiple balances, and multiple things that can be done vis-a-vis -vis the government. By the way, there's not just the government in the United States. Uh, pretty much anywhere you live, you're subject to several governments. The federal government, the state government, those are two sovereigns, and then you have the political subdivisions of the states. Uh, uh, rising up and putting down a tyrant when they start small in a little town, like in the Battle of Athens, is a proper use of the unorganized militia to, uh, to oust a tyrant. And indeed, it's quite effective because you stop them before they get very large and they get a lot of power. A Hitler does not miracle himself into being Hitler at the height of his power like that. It takes years. They all start somewhere. And if you stop them, then you don't have to contend with 100 million dead in a war 10 years down the road. You don't know what you're talking about. But I'll put that conversation off to the side. Uh, we can maybe have a separate, a separate conversation on that. If your argument is that your guns are the only thing keeping the government in check, then you're living in a delusion. If the government wanted you dead and your guns confiscated, you would not be shouting death to tyrants in your Don't Tread on Me shirt with a pistol on your hip. You're right. If the government wanted me dead, that's true. It becomes an entirely different calculus when it's if the government wanted that hundred million of you dead, or that fifty million of you dead. And it, it, is, it is not simply that my gun is the only thing, or my gun and my friend's gun is the only thing. It is one of several things to include the division of powers, uh, you know, federalism, both horizontal and vertical. Each state has its own military. That isn't by happenstance. Our resources that a federal army would require aren't under the, the, the federal army's direct control. Those are kept in states, like Texas, among others, that are historically uh, hostile to claims of federal power, particular, particularly when that claim of federal power is in derogation of state powers and states' rights. This is not accidental. These are all things that are put in to make it as difficult as possible for all these calamitous, large-scale tyrannies to occur. One of those things is what, uh, what is attributed to Yamamoto that he never actually said. There is literally a rifle behind every blade of grass in the United States. If you think military planners don't fear that, you don't know what you're talking about. I will direct your attention to Afghanistan. We are more than a decade into a war there, Victory is not in the cards for the United States in Afghanistan. 
We didn't learn this from when the Soviets went in, and the Soviets didn't learn it from the previous 2,000 years of everybody who has ever tried to invade Afghanistan has failed. These are people who ride fucking mopeds and donkeys with AK-47s and some piece of shit leftover Soviet-era RPGs who we can't defeat. The only way to... well, we could defeat them mil militarily if what we decided to do is to nuke the entire fucking region, to carpet bomb the entire region with enough artillery to make sure that everything there was dead. That's the only way you're going to win in Afghanistan. And uh, by golly, that's one, of the that's one of the things envisioned in a Second Amendment. You, federal government, you might win, but it will be a pure victory. It will be ashes in your mouth. There will be nothing left for you, Mr. Tyrant, to be in control of. We would much rather see all of us dead, the entire country raised to the ground, the whole continent raised to the ground, than to yield to a Hitler, to a Stalin, a Pol Pot, or pick your tyrant of choice. As uh, Judge Kaczynski of the Ninth Circuit put it, the Second Amendment is a doomsday provision for those exceptionally rare circumstances where the government won't stand for election, where judges are afraid to issue their decrees or can't find executive officials who will enforce their decrees. It is a bit of a legislative suicide pact. And if you think that doesn't bother uh, military planners, you don't know what you're talking about. One of the reasons it bothers them is because they understand guns in the same way that you were able to understand them a little bit before. They're, they actually are deadly. You don't get to have it both ways. Either they're deadly or they're not deadly. They are deadly. And nobody can occupy a civilian population or even a military population without ultimately having to send in fleshy little troops who you might have noticed from news stories of our little soirees in Afghanistan and Iraq and other places are perfectly susceptible to gunfire. By the way, we have advantages here, if it comes to it, that other countries don't have. Drones are hard to deal with. Drone operators aren't. Uh, they bullet through them works quite well. It takes many, many months to train a drone, a drone operator. Very easy to kill them. So too, by the way, are their families easy to kill here. Why? Because the people to be oppressed, unlike other countries, were already here and armed. There's, there's none of that, that uh, logistical problem of how do you get there. We're already here. Of course, none of us wants it to come to that. That's why we built all the other checks and balances. It's so that way you can with all good conscience, do your level best to avoid having to resolve these things uh, with the tool that ultimately is what dis disposes of these issues in the long run if you have an immovable object meeting an irresistible force. Armed conflict. We move heaven and earth to avoid it, but we will go this far and only that far. We will be pushed only so long. You'd be fucking dead. But to the responsible gun owners, I understand that most gun owners... See, this is a bit of a slight from the gun control fetish side, or the gun control advocacy side, because you don't understand the military uh, implications of how America is devised, because you don't understand the strategic and the tactical distribution of resources in this country, because you don't understand the governmental structure and why the states, uh, when they work together, have a, have a military that is actually larger than our federal military because you don't understand all of that and how uh, an organized and a disorganized, unorganized militia fit into this overall scheme of things because you haven't read the Federalist Papers, in short, doesn't mean that I haven't. And it doesn't make me an irresponsible gun owner because I know more about this than you know because I understand military strategy better than you understand military strategy to include guerrilla strategy. Your ignorance is not actually a restraint on my responsibleness and indeed uh, because I'm responsible, I learn about these things, not just from having served in a military and put my money where my mouth is, but because I consider it one of my duties as a citizen to know what it is that my government is doing and to know how it is that my government is organized. My governments are organized, I should say. It's in America. No, oh. my phone's turning off. I'm sorry. All right, I will leave it there. Um, maybe there's something left in the rest of the video I'll do a response to later if uh, you still want me to.
Uh, but I look forward to having a conversation with the autopsy, provided that uh, you're going to be intellectually honest. All right, everybody else have a good day.